Good morning once again. Welcome to BC201 course on Christian history and missions. Today we are going to study on um, the chapter 6. It talks about the restoration of the church. It's on page 90. Okay, I hope you all are on the same page. Page 90, chapter 6. Going to study or look into this chapter which talks about the restoration of the church, which is very important. So, as we study this chapter, I may request each of you all to, um, you know, turn through the scripture. So, I recommend you all to keep your Bibles ready so that we can study. <coughs> it's more to do today on studying the scripture, understanding what the church is all about. Okay, we have a few really We'll begin the class with a word of prayer. We'll also pray for the good net connection for people to join in. Okay, can I request one of you all to please pray? And uh, Jeffy or John Paul. Go ahead, Jeffy. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the class we are about to have. God, we invite your Holy Spirit to lead us throughout this class, Jesus. And we especially pray for the internet connection that we all will find the good internet connection throughout the class. We are so thankful that uh, you gave your life for us, Jesus, and we are so inspired by everyone who gave their life to live for you, Lord. Uh, we pray that as we listen to this class, this uh, revival fire will be ignited in us. Uh, we will be uh, inspired to seek you more, Jesus, as ma'am teaches us, help us to open our heart and mind and listen to it and help us to preach your gospel much more boldly, Jesus. Be with us and guide us in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. So we're going to study on the restoration of the church. As we study, can I request or to please turn to Lamentations chapter 5 verse 21. Chapter 5 verse 21 talks about, Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. Here it talks about how the Reformation makes a way for revival which often results in the restoration of the church in several areas. So when we talk about restoration or when we look back how the church was restored back, some of the very four key points. One is in the understanding of spiritual truth. Second, the restoration of the wine skin to contain new wine. Fourth is the restoration among God's people pursuing God's purpose. Restoration in church's impact on the world. Now we can look up at all these four points in detail, how these four areas, when how God brought the church back to life, how God restored the church back. Because we all studied like in 1500, there was a dark age. So even during this dark age time, how the Spirit of the Lord moved it. May I request one of us to please turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. Can I request you to read? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Jeffina, you can go ahead. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Till we all attain unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a full-grown man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we may be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried out with every wind of doctrine, but the slight of men in craftiness after the wiles of error. Amen. So, Amen. So what we see in the scripture, we see that through the centuries that the church's understanding of the spiritual was progressively restored. 
So what seemed to have been completely lost during the Dark Ages in 1500, but it was progressively rediscovered. God moved through his spirit among the re reformers and the revivalists who proclaimed and stepped into the, uh, you know, stepped into the ministry. So we see that even in the gospel in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, or Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, we see that it was God who was working through the offices to equip the saints, to equip the believers, to raise leaders, to actually ultimately uh, 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 complete the purpose of God in their life. So you see, uh, the people actually were raised, even in the dark ages, people raised through the reformers, through the revivalists, God raised the leaders so that the Christians can grow in maturity can increase in the knowledge of God, can grow in a greater intimacy where they can experience God. So we see that, uh, you know, what God desired for the church to walk in, in self-retreat. So some of them we have listed here in our notes on page 90. We see that the salvation by grace through faith. What a baptism for the believers sanctification and holy living, understanding and welcoming the work and ministry of the Spirit. We also see baptism in the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, growing in the knowledge of His Word, victorious Christian living, the role and function of the fivefold ministry, which is given in Ephesians 4, 11, equipping the saints in the work of the ministry. So God raised these fivefold offices nothing but to equip the saints, to expand the kingdom of God. And you see, these are the tools that the Spirit of the Lord worked and raised leaders for the church, for the saints to be equipped and grow in maturity, for them to experience the intimacy of God in their life. So as they were experiencing and growing, we see, we discussed the four points, right? Restoration and understanding spiritual truth. So when it say understanding the spiritual truth, the spirit of the Lord move among the people for them to understand the spiritual truth that we listed. With that, we see the next step, how the spirit of the Lord worked is uh, restoration of the wine skin to contain the new wine. So how did that happen? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 9, verse 17. May I request John to please read? Um. Could you say the reference again, please? Yes. Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verse 17. Matthew 9, verse right. 17. Okay, Matthew chapter 9, verse 17. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Thank you, John. So what we see here, we're talking about the second point, restoration in the wineskin to contain new wine. So we see that God is working continuously to develop new wineskin so that we can be ready for the new wine. So what is Jesus illustrating here through the wineskin? He explains that he did not come to repair or reform the old institution of Judaism. But here, Jesus is to institute a new covenant altogether. So in this new covenant, it doesn't just improve the old. It actually replaces and goes beyond it. So when Jesus is uh, introducing this uh, something new, not to patch up something old, but it is what the salvation is all about. So by illustrating this, Jesus didn't destroy the old covenant or the law, but he fulfills it. He fulfills it. He is uh, he is come to fulfill the law that was given. So he would form a new institution. What is that new institution? That's the church, the church which has a new covenant with Christ Jesus, where 
in this new institution, we see the Jews and the Gentiles come together with complete new body. This is what Paul explains in Ephesians chapter 2, 16. The church is brought together because in John 3, 16, we read that Jesus, God's only begotten son, came into this world to die for the world. It says he loved the world and he gave his only begotten son. So here it doesn't talk about any sect of people. It, it, it doesn't talk about only Jews or only Gentiles. It talks about the whole world, every creation, every human this, on this earth. Whoever believes in Jesus has been made one with him. They can be they can be from any caste, any tribe, any religion. Just by believing in Jesus, they become one with him. So this is a new covenant. This is something new, that the law, that the old covenant cannot accept it. But Jesus has come to establish the new institution, the church, which brings both the Jews and the Gentiles together into one body. We also see as reformers and the revivals continued among the church, it moved from one place to other. It grew from glory to glory, strength to strength. We see that it kept developing new wine skin. There was no same pattern being followed in every revival. Or no reformer, no revivalist leaders followed the same pattern. The only pattern that was followed in each and every revival was seeking God with one accord. Seeking God to move. But when God moved, he moved in different ways among the people where they could not put God in a box and name him, this is how God works. No. He works in new levels of faith, strength, glory, and the revelation that the church is brought into. So we see that during every revival that was birthed, there were a few things that brought something new, that is the new wineskin churches. There was a restoration in the fivefold ministry. There were unity and fellowship in the spirit among the leaders and believers, despite the denomination that they were from. There were unity. During the revival, that's what they saw. Different denominations come under one roof, that only the Lord can do it. There was unity. There was fellowship in the spirit. This is what is expected from the Lord, from each of us. The release of the moment that helps form the new wineskin churches. So there's a new moment, something new that God is birthing. And he did not stop there, but he is continuing to do it even among us. So when we talk about the new wineskin churches, we observe that the church uh, administration or the governance, the structure, method in which the church is functioning would change and adapt to what God is doing currently, or God is uh, uh, you know ministering to them, or moving the church into something new, to the modern age where they can impact the people in this generation. So the church need to be equipped needs to upgrade, needs to be updated according to the generation and see how the church can impact the people in the current generation. The church cannot continue to serve in the same old way, the same old method. People are changing, world is changing, world is growing, technology is growing. The church needs to upgrade and update itself to minister to the new generation. So this is something that we call it as new wine skin. The second is the restoration of the fivefold ministry. Can we turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, please? And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning of 
cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Thank you, John. So we see the restoration of the church through the fivefold ministry that the Christ has given. So along with the revivals, we also see there was a restoration of the leaders. So how do you see the restoration of leaders? Because during the revivals, what we see is leaders been raised. So at the time of revival, each revival, you see new leaders been burst into the ministry. And the leaders could be in any of the five offices. They could be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, or teachers, as it is listed in Ephesians 4, 11. So this does not mean that these functions did not exist before, but they were. They were. We also see in First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight, where it was, uh, where it talks about the apostle, prophet, and teacher. It was they did exist, but gradually it subsided. But during the dark age, we see how the spirit of the Lord moved among the leaders. We see the Lord called each one, specialized them, and He gifted them for the unique purpose. And each one grew and performed the purpose that they were called for. So we see the Reformation and the revivals progressed. We also saw people, uh, you know, began to function in this ministry office. Later in 20th century, as more and more people began to operate. <coughs> Uh, operate in these ministry areas as understanding of these ministry functions and and you know they were slowly accepted and they were established so these ministry offices were fully restored in the church and few of them we can name them as the evangelist we see in uh, starting 1950 we saw how god restored the office of the evangelist so some of the names were like Catherine Kuhlman, uh, we are on page 92, we see that uh, some of the leaders, some of the evangelists, okay, Catherine Kuhlman, William Braham, A. A. Allen, uh, Lester, okay, let me display this for you so that we are all on the same page, just give me a minute, please. Give me a minute while I share the notes on the screen so that all of us can view the same page. We all can see this? Okay. <clears throat> so some of them were Kathleen Kulmit, William Braham, um, you know, A. A. Allen, who had an amazing healing ministry. Then we also see Lester Sambral. Jack Coy, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, uh, and uh, Charles and Francis Hunter, Franz Hunter, T.L. and Daisy Osborne, Dr. Deejas Dinagarin, Rennie Bunky, Benny and Randy Clark. There were many evangelists were raised and they were ministered in 1950s. So class, there's a small assignment, OK? So what we could do is, in next class, we could share, uh, just each of us can take five minutes, pick up any of these people, each one. You all can just uh, uh, put the name of the person whom you would like to share for five minutes in the text column on the chat so that you know, there's no repeat. We can just talk about them for five minutes, what the ministry was all about and how they impacted the nation with what gift they flowed in. And we know that it's an evangelist, but how did they flow in? What office, how they ministered to people? You know, very brief, just, just for five minutes or less than five minutes. It can be three minutes or so, okay? Each of y'all can please pick, there are 13 leaders here, pick, any one okay and then we also see in late 1960 the office of the pastors was restored and in 1970 we see that the kenneth hagen senior derek prince bill johnson they were established in the ministry of pastor and teacher 
And later in 1980, we see that the prof, the minister of the prophet was established, like Kenneth Hagin, Bill Hammond, Dr. Tejas Dinagaran, they flowed in this ministry. And it is not only they were only a prophet, but then they were evangelists, but they were also flowing in the prophetic ministry. And later we also see in 1990, the function of the apostle was fully restored through Dr. Bill Hamson, Hammond, Bill Johnson and Randy Clark. So here we are to clarify and understand the apostles and prophets who function in the church today were different from the 12 apostles of the Lamb, which is stated in Revelation chapter 21, verse 14. And the founding apostles, okay, and the founding apostles of, uh, uh, of the church. So in today's Apostle and Prophets, we see that the ministry and the function of the fivefold ministry was fulfilled. Some of them were unity and fellowship in the spirit among the leaders and believers across the denomination lines. And also we can cover the release of the moments that help form the new wineskin churches. How? different moments took place, the Pentecostal moment. We will discuss on this point a little later on the unity and fellowship in the church because I would like to go in little detail on that, okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, the release of the moment that helped form the new wineskin churches. So what happened? The, in 1900, there was a Pentecostal moment which emphasized on the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, which gave birth to different denominations, such as the Assemblies of God, which is also known as the AG Churches, and the Church of God. And in 1940, we see the latter rain movement that took place, and they emphasized on the believers could manifest the gifts of the Spirit and declare the restoration of the fivefold ministry. At this moment, slowly moved to a rural hamlet known as the Northern Battleford in um, Saskatchewan, Canada, which resulted in many restoration churches being planted worldwide. So some of the moments that has been listed in our notes, we see that in 1970 to 1990, the World of Faith movement was introduced, where the believers were brought into an understanding of how to walk by faith, healing, righteousness, prosperity, and their identity in Christ Jesus. Well, slowly, we also see simultaneously there's an overlap between 1960 to 1970. There was a charismatic moment which was birthed in, where in this moment, we see the believers were encouraged to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. And from 1970 to 1980, you see the Jesus moment took place, where during this moment, we see there was an emphasis on how loving and accepting people were for who they are and bringing them into the, uh, into the person of Christ, into the work of the Holy Spirit. So some of the fast growing church in the US were this denomination which birthed out of this Jesus moment. And the, at the same time, in 1970, there was another moment that took place that's called as worship moment where new songs and praise were released. So some of the ministries like Maranatha, Integrity, Osana, Vineyard, Hillsong, Jesus Culture, and many other ministries were birthed in. And later we see in 1980 to 2000, the third wave movement was taking place. When this mo through this moment, we see the charismatic experience as well as the power of the evangelism among all the believers. So there were leaders like <clears throat> John Wimbler. One second, please. Thank you. 
So we see some of the leaders like John Wimber and others were uh, very important and became a prominent leader during this third wave movement. And simultaneously, during this time in 1980, there was another ongoing prayer and intercession movement that was led by Rees Howells, followed by his son Samuel Howells, were leaders in the intercessory prayer movement during the 20th century. And also during this time, we also see Pastor David Yongi Cho, the pastor of the uh, Yodo Full Gospel Church in Seoul, South Korea. He established a prayer mount with night and day prayer in 1973. We also see Larry Lea was also used by God to further the international prayer moment at this point. The International House of Prayer, which is also known as IHOP, led by Mike Bickel, is based in Kansas City, Missouri, and has been having 24 by 7 prayer and worship since September 19, 1999. Till date, this ministry is ongoing. And in 1980, we see there's an, another ongoing church growth movement took place where we see the cell church pioneered by David Yogi Cho and other innovative ways to experience the church growth accelerated in this place. We see they grew to become the mega church in the whole world. And in 2000, and ongoing, we see the saints' moment took place. Where we, uh, what happened during the saints' moment is they were equipping and releasing God's people into God's ministry. There were some leaders that emerged that were raised, like Francis Macnet in 1925 to present, and Bishop Bill Hammond, John Wimber, John and Carol Arnott, Randy Clark. Bill Johnson, and there were many other leaders we raised into this moment. At the same time, we also see there was another moment took place in the same year, Marketplace Ministry. What happened? The Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship International was birthed in. We also see International Christian Chamber of Commerce, which is known as ICCC, where, uh, where the pioneers in 1950, followed by many others who were serving and mobilizing among these believers to make a difference for God's kingdom. So they were focusing on equipping the believers uh, in the seven mountain areas to make a difference, to impact people even at the marketplace. So as God was moving in this, we see the third restoration in God's people pursuing God's purpose. So what was God's people doing? God's purpose. How did they fulfill? As we see in Ephesians 4, 11, the fivefold ministry of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers, we see the Lord's intent that the saints should be equipped. The leaders should be raised. The purpose of God to be fulfilled. How? Because God desires to fulfill his purpose among the people. For that he raises leaders time and again from the Old Testament to the New Testament to our present age. We see how the Lord moves. Lord moves through his own people. He desires that way. And he has not been choosing the uh, the wisest man or somebody who's uh, who's grown and who's well talented and equipped. But here, as per the word, God chooses the simple, where he can pour out his glory, where people can look at the leaders and glorify the God who's working and serving among them. So it is the Lord who equips the work of the ministry so that the church can be built, can be reformed, can be set as a salt and light in the place where God has raised the leaders for and for the very purpose that he's been calling into that place. But that we will move on to the next point, which is the restoration in the church. Restoration in the church to impact the world. Can I request one of us to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, please? 
Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 to 16. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under food by men? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and, give, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you. Yeah. So what we see here is in this scripture that we are the salt and the light. We need to have this purpose within us so that the reformation and the revivals can be restored in the church. Because the salt and light is very important to impact the believers. How can we impact? By equipping them through the word. How can we equip them? We need to be first equipped. When we are equipped in the word, as the scripture says, we need to be rooted and grounded in the word. When we are rooted and grounded in the word, we see the truth will set us free. When the truth sets us free, we cannot contain this light and the revelation that God gives us to ourselves. Whereas we will start stepping out to equip others. Where God will help us to step up and step out for us to be that salt and light. Salt that can, you know, emerge and transform people's life. Light that can proclaim the word. And he will also make us the voice, voice to the nation. So believers, whichever place we are in, when we are equipped in the word, when Lord releases and releases us into the missions, here we are set in the marketplace, in different areas, in different set. And here we will go ahead to impact the area that Lord has set us on an assignment. So we also see in today's time where the local churches are coming together, the citywide church, where they are beginning to actively impact the believers actively see how they can be the salt and light to the city and to the nation and to the nations so with that we will move on to the point the second point where we uh, talk about the unity this is something that we need to focus on this is something that we need to keep in our mind as we serve in the ministry <clears throat> i'm just checking yeah Unity and fellowship in the spirit. We discussed this in the second part. Restoration of the fivefold ministry. We all are called to serve. You know, Lord has raised us to serve in the fivefold ministry. So, what is important for us to serve, branch out in this fivefold ministry is unity. Unity and fellowship in the spirit among the leaders across the denomination lines. How do you think that we can impact the nation? This is something that the New Testament church is looking at. The unity of the church is one of the most important in the New Testament. It's also one of the difficult area that for us as a church to function as well. So in the New Testament, we see that the local church was primarily defined by the city. By the church in Jerusalem, Antioch, Ephesus, Corinth, Rome, or you know, whichever place that Paul went and ministered to. But all who believed. So, how did these church function? How did Paul minister to this people? We see that in all these epistles, we see that Paul ministered like all who believed in Jesus were part of the church in that city where they lived. Probably it may be a larger city or the small places. But in these churches, the people gathered were different from different set, different tribe. They were Gentiles, they were Jews who gathered into this church. So what was something that Paul was emphasizing here was no denomination. He was bringing both of them together under one base, believe in Jesus Christ so that you and your household will be saved. So they all had one 
thing in their mind that they need to believe in Jesus Christ, the work that he did. So both today, in today's generation, all our churches across our uh, nation, we see there's a Protestant churches, Catholics, all Orthodox churches, Pentecost, Methodist, so many denominations. But what each one of them are doing? Are we focusing <clears throat> ourselves and our church into how Apostle Paul was preaching and sharing the word, focusing on Jesus? And him alone, or are we uh, focusing ourselves into the denomination and trying to grow and establish that particular denomination? So, what is our focus on then today? So, why is it different for all these denomination churches to come under one roof? We need to think. Why do you think it is difficult? Class, y'all can answer. Can we be focused like the Apostle Paul, who focused on Jesus, focused on believing on Jesus, than on any kind of traditional belief that each denomination that separated according to the later part of the church? Sometimes it's very difficult to bring all the leaders under one roof, isn't it? Because most of them are different in their own doctrine and the practices. So it's very difficult to bring them all under one roof. But as a Christians, as a student of the word, we need to know unity is very important. What should be our main focus on? Our main focus should be on Jesus and how the Spirit of the Lord is working in today's church. How the church was birthed in shame. Where was the focus on? Was it on the tradition? Was it on the doctrine? Or was it on Jesus? We need to focus that. We need to think biblically what it means and how we can apply it in our time, in our day, under our leadership. Why is it? We need to think. We need to ask certain question to ourselves. Like, I would like to ask a few questions to our uh, class today. Why is Christian unity is important? Why do you think it's important? Class, you all can unmute and speak. Why do you think it's important? E-learning, you all can also post your comments on the discussion tab that has been created. Why do you think? Christian unity is very important. Because we are part of a body and body cannot function by just organs. Um, and we are also building and building uh, cannot function by just the stones. Um, it's a picture of church that uh, Jesus has explained to us and uh, through his word. So it is important for us to have unity to stand together and to fulfill his desire on the earth. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. Very important to have unity, just like what John said. Christ died on the cross to secure this unity, isn't it? You see, he died on the cross. He gave himself to bring us all together. In Ephesians 2, 13 to 16, Paul also writes saying, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barriers of dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing the peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. 
So Paul is writing, in Jesus' times itself, there were a lot of barriers between the Jews and the Gentiles. So Paul is struggling hard to reveal the revelation according to what Jesus said. So he says that Jesus died on the cross to bring the Jews and the Gentiles, to bring the people, despite the tribe or the denomination that they are in, under one body. Just like what John said, one body, we all are of one body, there should be unity in one body so that the kingdom of God can expand and flourish and grow. If among the kingdom of God, one, one is against another, how can the kingdom of God establish and expand and grow and flourish if there's fight among the brothers? So we should come in one mind with one God because Christ had died on the cross for us to break the barriers and come under one unity and under one mind, one God. So when we come under one mind and one God, you see the Spirit of the Lord work to bring God's purpose into us. You see, from the day of Pentecost to the revivals which were birthed, you see, Wherever there was one mind and one called through unity when they prayed, you see the Spirit of the Lord move supernaturally. There's the birth of God's purpose among the people in the city, in the nation. So they should be unity because only in unity, God can accomplish his purpose. God can move through people and we see revival take place. We also see that the unity is very important among the Christians because it's, it, is a, it is a major factor for us to witness to the world. As uh, you know, Apostle Paul states in John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23, when we read this verse, he says, in Paul's days, there was a divide, as I said, in Jews and Gentiles. It was huge. People, you know, they will refuse even to pass through that area. They will actually walk around the area, even if it is a long distance, they will walk, but they will not pass through. They feel it is, they are untouchable. The hatred was so huge. So if the church could display to the world the unity between these groups that Christ had secured on the cross, it would be more powerful for us to witness. Jesus said the same thing. Jesus said the same thing as a high priest prayer a night before he was crucified. He said, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That they may all be one. I'm reading from John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. So I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. This is very important, isn't it? So the unity that Jesus secured on the cross is something very spiritual. It is not visible to our naked eyes, but something very spiritual. But it is a visible expression when we believe in Jesus. We see there's a unity. So the Bible is talking about the unity that is actually not very outwardly seen, but something that has been birthed inward, which is real, which is shared the Christ and nature among the believers. So it is for us to, it is very important for us to understand that we need to stay in unity. We need to, uh, you know, make a decision. It may not be something very natural, but it is a decision that we make to stay in unity for the sake of Christ, because Jesus died on the cross for us to be united in them. We see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, and also in other uh, scriptures, we see how, what Paul says, 
diligently to preserve the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. So the unity of spirit is already something that every believers need to preserve it. So this is what Paul mentions as the unity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, he says, For by one spirit we were all baptized in one body. Whether it may be Jews or Greeks, whether it can be slave or one who is free, but we were all made to drink one spirit. We were all made to come under one hope with Christ. We were all made to believe on the one Jesus Christ who died on the cross for each of us. So there is a unity on the very purpose that Jesus died on the cross for you and me. So we need to set our focus on that. So some of the spiritual reality we see that is Christian unity is not an organizational unity. So organizational when it comes as the, uh, you know, the World Council of Churches or the uh, National Council of Churches, they promote something very organizational or something very external unity among the other denominations. We are not talking about that. That may diminish as the time goes. But what Christ is talking about, the inward unity. Christ was not praying for one world church organization. He's not talking about that. But he's talking about the governing body coming under one unity. We also see, second point here is Christian unity is not, is not uniformity. Being one body in Christ does not mean that we all must look alike, talk alike, enjoy the same kind of activities. No, back in early 1970s, we see there was a uh, happy moment, young people who got swept in the local church. They were from a different background. They were doing drugs, they had long hair, different style. But then what happened? Lord moved among them and they were drawn to the church. So it can be different ways that God can work among different people. In fact, church had kept these people aside where they were like non-touchable people. But then God moved among them. Who are we to say they are not touchable? Like how God showed Peter under the bed sheet, he put different animals under one bed sheet. And you know, God asked uh, Peter, eat. And he said, Lord, those are unclean. But what point God was making, what I have made clean, who are you to say it's clean? I died for all these people. How can you separate them from me? For example, a very good example is one of the marriage example when God unites them, let not man put in the center. When God has called the people to be one in body with him, who are we to you know, separate them under the name of denomination or the caste, tribe, style? Let our focus be set on Jesus. Let us uh, focus be, uh, you know, uh, 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 set on Jesus and him alone, just like the early church. Bring everyone together under one roof. Yes, I agree that different denominations may have different doctrines, which may, which may not be biblical, which may be tradition-based according to the place, culture, tribe. We may not agree. But let's look at on some things that are biblical, that is on the common ground that all of us could agree on. Let's set a focus on that so that we can discuss and grow as one body in Christ. Leave the rest to Lord, because that's what the word of God says. When, when they know the truth, the truth will set them free. Let the Lord judge them. Let the Lord minister to them. But let's be in one in unity based on what the word of God says and agree on what the biblical uh, ground is. So let's set a focus on what God, Jesus, has established on the unity to bring each of us under one in him. And let's set a focus and not keep ourselves separated under the name of any kind of denomination because God's work can be accomplished. God's work can move, expand and go beyond when we believers come under one roof, when we believers come with true unity within us. Because the Bible says, the scripture says that if you hate your brother. Now, when he talks about brother, he talks about one who is in the law, different denomination. If you hate your brother, you are a murderer. Isn't it? The scripture says that. 
So if you ate your own brother, different denomination, then we are not, again, we are not according to what God says. There's no love in us because God loves the world. He died on the cross for each of us. So let's focus on Jesus for the purpose that he came into this world, that he died on the cross for you and me. And let's focus on the unity that Christ has established and see how we can minister and serve and expand God's kingdom in each of us, in, in the place that we are placed, uh, in the region that we are there. Let's focus on that. Ask God, God, give us the mind to think big. Give us the heart to expand ourselves. Lord, help us to look at people with the love that God has called each one of us. Okay? So with that, we will pray. Can I request one of us to please read Ephesians 4.25? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. I just want to close with this verse. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. I'm just reading. I'll read it for everyone. It says, Do not grieve the spirit, therefore, putting away lying. Let each of you speak the truth. Speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So let's pray. Father, as we work towards building your kingdom, serving in your kingdom, Lord, we pray that you will expand our heart and mind to have oneness of mind in you, O oh Father. The work that you established the very purpose that you came into this world to die for each of us, Lord, despite our background, despite our culture, despite our denomination, despite the religion that we are in, people of different faith. Lord, you came into this world and you died. And you said those who believe in Jesus receive the salvation, which is a free gift, which is an eternal life. For each of us. Lord, we thank you that each of us, as we serve, we have the oneness of mind, oh Father. Let nothing come in between to stop the glory of God. Lord, I pray that you will teach each of us to be that role model to people around us, oh Father, so that we may experience the love of God and, and show the love of God to people around us, Lord. Father, I also pray that you will grant us the patience. You will renew and reform us, Lord, that we may flow with the God kind of love, that we may love each other with the heart and mind that you have for each of us, Lord. Help us to see the Christ nature in each of them, Lord, the good in each one, and see how we can establish and establish our kingdom on this earth, oh, Father. In everything, Lord, help us to give us an understanding and a heart of compassion to be moved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that there is a change of heart, change of mind, so that we may work as you. We may have the mind of Christ, the love of God in our heart and in our mind, that we may serve each other despite the background, despite the tribe, despite the culture, despite the denomination. But keeping you in our mind, we will serve our Lord for the expansion of the kingdom of God, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray that let your word be grounded in our heart and in our mind. As your word says, let the truth, let the truth set us free, Father. Let your truth minister to each of us. And let it set us free from everything that is not of yours, Lord. Let your kingdom come. And your kingdom be established in and through us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for doing great and mighty things through each of us, Lord. Despite the place distance that each of us are. Thank you for using us mightily for your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. Thank you. God bless. I hope the session was a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. God, God bless you. Thank you.
Thank you.